So Dr. Michael Margolis is a very passionate advocate of natural medicine. After 25 years of, as a physician, he is going to show you how you're going to help your patients with their bone problems. Dr. Margolis. It's those crazy bones. What can you say? Thank you, David. You know, it, it humbles me because I look over the room and Aris over there, Michael Gerber sitting up here front. These are my teachers. Chet's over here. I learned a lot from Chet. And, uh, you know, I can't see every face from this spot. But it, it's humbling to be up in front of people who got me started in this. I would like to recognize Jerry E. Boko. He's going to be one of our speakers tomorrow. He's in retirement and busier than heck. He's an oral pathologist, general pathologist, diplomat. And when I made this presentation up, I sent it to him to review. And he put the bazaz into this entire presentation because I didn't have the resources and pictures that he does or the imagination. But what we're talking about is diagnosis and treatment of ischemic osteonecrotic uh, lesions of the human bone, the human jaw, which if you talk to people until bisphosphonate drugs came out, that never existed. Those people belong to the uh, established schools. The controversy. Only recently has the traditional medicine and dentistry begun recognizing the potential inflammatory and infective cause for at least some of the degenerative disorders in humans. Mouth bacteria seem to play a major role in this regard. While most oral bacterial studies are mucosal, especially gingival, something to do with the heart, similar bacteria may be found within the bone itself even in a radiographic and clinically normal bone. The side effects of dental procedures done daily throughout the world today are not typically recognized. Radiographic imaging is inadequate to identify ischemic and low-grade inflammatory disorders of the jawbone which are predominantly in the marrow of the bone, nor does it show the toxic nature of root canal teeth. However, inflammation is there. In my office, it's called My Dentist, and our logo is Thinking Outside the Mouth. If you go back and if you enjoy history, which I do, I love this man, Western Price, who was the head of all research for the emerging organization called the American Dental Association. And his theory, an infection of one part of the body, the focal infection theory, that can cause problems in others. Traditional dentistry and medicine confirm this every day as we practice. When a patient has a heart condition, kidney problems, artificial joints, or other conditions that may be affected by your overall health, the dentist will premedicate prior to invasive dental care. That even includes a cleaning, anything that's going to cause bleeding. Focal infection is a source of infection, may become a health interruption in distant parts of the body. Materials in your mouth, as we all know, may affect the lining of the intestinal tract, muscles, joints, or other parts of the body. The remaining periodontal ligament left after an extraction of a tooth can become an energy flow interrupter and cause problems along the acupuncture meridians, especially with impacted wisdom teeth. So using new techniques to identify marrow disorders is something that is now on the forefront. I was privileged enough to be part of a team with uh, the late Robert Jones to submit scientific proof that the ultrasonic machine, which he called the Cavitat, was an actual diagnostic tool. In fact, if you know the story, we were approved with the highest rating possible by the uh, FDA original committee. The part that we don't know too much about, which I, unfortunately I do know, three days later that uh, certification was taken away and a new committee was formed with members of the American Dental Association. And after a lot of money in a year, they got one of the lowest ratings possible for a diagnostic tool. 
the original studies showed that we took over 1,300 different samples. Myself, uh, I only put in about 450 of them, and part of it was my study at Capital University showing that the Cavitat identified these lesions in 99.6% of the study, and it made, um, made it showing that it was one of the top diagnostic tools. And now we also have a great tool that's out there in traditional dentistry, and that's your cone beam uh, computerized tabography imaging, or CBCT, and it is a heck of a tool, and it will show things if you look. Very thin slices in three dimensions plus pantographic views with the ability to flow through a large number of adjacent images and create a 3D image. It is so cool. You can take parts of the jaw and you can highlight them and see exactly what you're looking for uh, in that cross section. Quantitative ultrasound, sound tra traverses best via moist, thick trabeculae. So basically what happens, if it's healthy bone and there is good flow of blood and interstitial fluids, the, the sound wave will go through the jaw. If it's empty, then what happens, the sound wave is interrupted. So I like to compare it to a bunch of locusts going through a valley. You see this beautiful green valley. The locusts come through and you see this devastation. That's the difference between a healthy bone and a non-healthy bone. The Cavitat scan, examples of great uh, images, you'll see number three, a breakdown up here, and number one is very, very healthy, as is number zero. If they have it up there, that's a zero. Two is very, very common, but three and four, you should consider doing surgical intervention. Now, unfortunately, the Cavitat is no longer available. Robert has passed away. There is a project going on in England today. It's called the Cavi Scan, and one of our uh, members from England, his son is an engineer who is going to re-engineer the entire technology and have that available hopefully in another year to be able to go. It is an excellent, excellent tool and one piece of the art to be able to diagnose these things. So bringing together the best of both worlds. When you combine traditional radiography with new imaging techniques, that's a cone beam computed topography, Cavitat through Tremission uh, alveolar sonography to evaluate the low density and ischemic bone marrow changes, then integrate the results with the patient's existing conditions. Don't forget to look at the patient. Before I get started on my patients, I ask them if they're having problems, nobody can solve them, please write out a health history. Tell me what led you to this place and how did you find me? And you go through that entire thing and make sure that it's there. Which reminds me, um, the AGD disclaimer. Sorry, I was supposed to start out with this. I do have a little financial uh, um, endeavor in this because I do give classes in this and if you look at the chairs up here and over there I have information on October 21st and 22nd of this year I'm going to be doing classes. Every three to four months I'll be doing classes on this and teaching other doctors because I'm not the only one doing this. There's a lot of members here that are doing great jobs with it and we have a lot of potential members that need to learn how to do it and we'll teach you how to identify and treat the these conditions. So there's our plug there, but um, the um, whole point of this is education and get everybody involved. So what we want you to see is on this x-ray, you will see that there's a shadow there. Black in an x-ray is either going to be the sinus, it's going to be the oral cavity up here by the crown, or it's going to be a lesion inside the bone. So missing teeth, root canal teeth, differential, uh, different type of restorations and appliances, you want to look around them. So what about the best of both worlds? Add in DNA, test of organisms that are present. Uh, Blanche is here so you can tell her or ask her more connections about the dental DNA. Formerly uh, it was called dental DNA, now it's dental connections. There's their information, you can call them. I love using their product, it helps us out. And most of the time when I talk to doctors and I share this information with them, they say, well, what do we do with it? 
I said, well, don't you know anything about microorganisms? What would you do with it? And so we discuss how patients get treated. So with the methodology, all patients were randomly selected from my patient's uh, pool. Patients were given the opportunity to opt out of this study. I didn't charge them any extra. I did do two biopsies, but charged them for one. After all patient intake information was completed, a full initial exam was instituted. Existing patients were not excluded from the study because a few people who had already had things done and when I was telling them about what I was going to do with this, they all said, hey, I'd like to participate can you take me as a patient? Uh, we did the complete missing existing teeth periodontal charting, classification of their periodontal conditions, recording their dental history, soft tissue conditions, TMJ, which I tell people are a condition, not a disease. Pictures of both arches. Don't forget to take a picture of the patient's mouth before you get started. I had a patient after we cleaned up her mouth, she says, I got all this gum recession I never had before. And we pulled out the pictures. I said, is this your mouth? And it was identical. There was no recession. But they don't know that. So uh, full x-rays, not only a cone beam, but also a full series of x-rays. And then we uh, have had a cavitat for, I don't know how many years, nine? Uh, no, actually, nine, uh, 2001 or 2000 is when I had ours. So 16, 17 years. So this is, was a retrospective record review too. No treatment or diagnostic tests were done solely for research. By putting together the results of the patient's subjective complaints, radiographic information, and the ultrasonic imaging measurements, a treatment plan was put together and patients were scheduled for their surgeries. Sites suspected of having a lack of bone density or a site possible infection or toxic conditions by combining the actual images of the jawbone, density measurements of the CBC CT and or combined or confirmed by the CT or the uh, Cabotat uh, scans were surgerized. So we excised two different type of biopsies. We submitted one to DNA Connection and the other was first to West Virginia University and then we switched back to the University of Texas at Houston because they definitely have their stuff together. Uh, don't, don't send out to West Virginia. Uh, methodology, comparing results. So I wanted to take a look at this and say, okay, does the CT or the CBCT and radiography come together with the cavitat, with ultrasound? Did it match? And then what condition did I get histologically and what bugs were present? So clinical case studies. Patient number one, 44-year-old uh, female, complaints, very sick she suffers from dizziness, fatigue, and tired all the time. Neurological pain, pain of her ears, TM joints, sinus problems right side of her neck and head. Patient is very anxious. She used to be a gymnast. So you look at her and she's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, she's beautiful. But she's in so much pain, she can't even smile. She's about that tall, and she used to do flips and all these. Uh, she, her favorite was the uh, balancing beam. Two daughters that were involved in, in uh, gymnastics, and she was trying to coach them, but couldn't do it. But now her husband couldn't take her being sick anymore. You know that word for better or for worse? didn't mean anything to him. He was, he was shot. And for good, well, not for good reasons, because I believe that spouses should support each other, but she was also emotionally drained from this. Her doctor can't figure it out. Nobody can figure it out. All her lab reports are normal. So we started seeing a naturopath who recommended her to come see me. And so if you take a look, uh, I don't know why her crowns aren't sitting on top of these root canals. They were all metal-based crowns with nice, pretty porcelain. And so we go ahead, we look at her perio. I'm like, gosh, she really cares about her teeth and her looks. No perio problem whatsoever. And now we look at the uh, comb beam, imaging case number one. So when you look at this, two root canals, two root canals, root canal here and up there, uh, the third molar areas were all very, very non-dense. So we take a look at the cavitat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this easy for everybody as we go along. We're going to combine these together. But this is the first area number one or 
upper right eight uh, or number one, depending upon what number system you want, upper left uh, 15, 16, or seven and eight. And down below, it's going to be six, seven, eight, or it's going to be 17, 18, 19, and then 30, 31, 32, or it's going to be six, seven, eight over here. That just measures bone density. It doesn't say anything if there's infection there, but if uh, it smells like a rose, looks like a rose, and you stick yourself, it's a rose. So here we go. We're taking a look at a grade 3, 3, and 0. 0 is very, very healthy. 1 is not bad. And then so what we have on the left side, this is the upper right, and on the right side, that's the upper left. Take a look at the radiolucency on the base of that root canal. So, CB versus the quantitative ultrasound, it's showing us that this is not very dense over here on any of these areas on the lower three spots of both sides of the jaw. So what I did was I made a little chart here and I went through and I use a Galileo, Serrano Galileo set. I had somebody come up to me and says, I can't get this thing to work because I have all your Galileo's thing, but on my uh, millennium, I have negatives and positives. So there is no standard form or standard standard for any of this stuff when it comes to the comb beams. Each one has their own measuring device. So on the Galileos, anything that's below 1550 is not very good bone. But if you're going to use a, C, a CBCT, What's going to happen is it doesn't differentiate between bone and tooth, but it does differentiate between bone and tooth when you're using the cavitat. So all these are going to be threes and fours along here on those grades. But the measurements here are going to vary. 1411 at the top, and then you go further down, and you'll see some at 1505, 1777, 1776. So all these root canal teeth that we're showing high density to compare with the 3, 3D. So the reason these two te technologies don't always agree is the Cavitat measures not only bone density, but also bone desiccation, desiccation while ignoring the teeth. The CTCB uh, measures the density of whatever is present, including the teeth. Therefore, without panoramic radiograph, I want to underline this. You cannot use an 18 series PAs to treat this. You must have at least, at minimum, a panoramic x-ray. Best today, because it really is cheap compared to what it was 25 years ago, uh, C, uh, CB, uh, CT or CD uh, 3D is going to be the best thing for you to use because you can go through and manipulate these things and look at it. So in fact, the density has approved this, um, the DA has approved this technology only as an adjunct test and not a standalone. So I like to put all these things together and back it up and go from there. So here we go. We've got the four areas. Look at individual sites. So let's go to the first site. When you look at this upper right, you're going to see the area quantitatively one and two, high positive osteoporotic bone, desiccated bone or hollow bone. In the radiographically number area, diffuse radiolucency, bone density is less than 1500 in area one symptoms. Orally, the patient has no pain or symptom. We found that kind of interesting because she just felt miserable all over the place. But she had no pain in her mouth. And when Dr. Boko came up with the, uh, the Ackerman NICO, 98% of his patients had oral pain. As he's gone through more over the last 20 plus years, 28 years, he's finding that most patients don't seem to have oral pain, but they got body pain. So we go ahead and we do a DNA test. And you take a look at some of these crazy things. This is always a tough one. HPV, 58. And Tebia species. This we found in like 98% of our cases. And then you'll see some others that are present. We don't know exactly what all this means yet because we don't have enough in a pool or a study. But we do know that when we looked at this, 
the microbe DNA and Tebia species, with the exception of Tebia gingivitis, all Entebia species are found in the intestines, amoeba biasis, amoeba centrary, and amoeba liver abscesses. So it seems to be hanging around some diseases that are possibly connected to the mouth as a source because this was so highly concentrated in most of our stuff. The HPV 58 has a higher association with development of severe cervical dysplasia with women than HPV 16. So when you have people coming in, we're not only finding HPV in women's mouths, but also men. And so an opportunistic uh, pathogen cause of actinomyces, also actinomyces israeli is very, very common. And the Campobacteria gracius uh, rectus are both uh, apical infections and have a pathological role. So histology, we look at it, we got viable bone in here, marrow with medullary con, uh, congestion. A lot of these we think may be a cause towards strokes and heart attacks because you get these clots and congestion here and can influence your heart and your circulation because if you know your, your tooth chart, your wisdom teeth are going to be on your heart and circulation. And so you want to take a look at people with their health histories and you also want to look at their ears. If they got a nice little fold in the lobe of their ear, that is a sign of blood circulation problems and possible strokes. So that's Chinese medicine that you may want to look at. So we continue in the area and we see, you know, in summary, we've got a positive grade three, diffuse radiolucency, bone density is low. So uh, chronic ischemic bone disease is what we found in that area. So let's take a look at 15 and move along. We have a very similar case. We've got over here the quantitative high scores of 3-3, then all of a sudden it's healthy around that tooth. Look at the radiolucency on that um, root canal. And those just flow back and forth. So it's, it's not good. We look at, again, HPV. You'll see in tabia uh, specimens. And then we take a look at this. Now, in the second column, you'll see that I put down the toxicity of everything. They measure as toxic anything over 9, 9.5. So these are just the toxic ones we found. And think of the accumulated aspects. So the HPV-16 cancer-related sexually transmitted virus. So when you get these patients that come in and they start reading this stuff, they kind of have a heart attack. I said, well, don't you like the fact that we took that out of you? You don't want to keep it in you. But we don't know if this is normal or abnormal anymore in our society. So as we go along, we look at the histology report. 16 predominantly non-viable bone, consistent with chronic ischemic bone disease, fibrogen sludge, occluding vessels. Again, I emphasize the heart and people having problems with, whoops, sorry. Oh, try to get back to where we were. Let me see, I'm sorry. Here we go. The fibrogen sludge, loose aggregates of fibrogen in the lumen. You don't want that floating around your circulation. So on, nine, on 15 and 16, what we're looking at, in summary, Entobia species, HPV 58, 16, Acetomyces granuloceria, uh, Campylobacter showy, and HPV 39. So very, very uh, high virus counts here, and uh, we have with our uh, Cabitat, a positive high grade, the CBCT diffuse multiocular uh, radiolucencies and low densities. So these are the areas you want to go in and clean up. So let's look at 17 and 19. We have the quantitative uh, effect again of what the Cabitat shows, very, very poor. And if we could blow this up, and I unfortunately don't 
have that CT on here, I would blow it up for you. You would see that this is a lot darker than what we showed on this. It's a high-grade positive osteoporotic bone. It's diffuse, mild radiolucency. And again, she had no symptoms. But take a look again at all the bacteria that we came up with. Another HPV and Tebia species. And then Provotelia uh, negracini uh, is there. 18, 19, we're root canal 17 old extraction sites. So what we try to do is we go ahead and we look at what levels of toxicity we have again. And again, the winner is in Tobia species with a very high uh, problem there. And what do some of these bacteria do? Well, we know that Protelvia or Prevotella is a normal oral uh, flora, but capable of enhancing local infections uh, from other Oral bacteria triggers extra strong immune responses. So what's that going to do? It's going to increase our uh, C-reactive protein inflammatory process in the body. Does that cause a problem anywhere? So we go ahead and we look at this uh, last, last one, the few, uh, Fusobacterium uh, nucleotum. I need to take a course on how to pronounce all these things. I'm sorry. But I just got done reading a report that this offending bacteria found very commonly in the mouth is also associated with colon cancer and more reports are coming out on it. So we look at the histological aspects, the residual necrotic pulpal debris, apical canal, endodontically treated tooth. And so you can see the uh, residual uh, necrotic pulp. The ne necrosis is the pink, out of percha is black. So you basically have an active infection going on here. So you're producing a non superative toxic solution that is going throughout your whole body. So pretty cool stuff that we're looking at. And Jerry understands all these things, and he'll be here tomorrow. You can ask him questions. And so we have over here the lower left side summaries of what we found. The Antibia species, Actinomyces and Prevotella, HPV, uh, a whole sleuth of hosts of toxic level uh, presence of these bacterium and viruses. We have radio, uh, radiology, we have diffuse mild radiolucency. The bone density again is low. And we have uh, a residual necrotic pulp debris in root canals. I don't care how good you are at root canals, and God knows before I went uh, and learned about them, I was doing 10, 10 of them a month. I would have an endodontist call me and say, you do a great job and all that. And then all of a sudden, I started sending them George Meinig's book. <laughs> I wasn't very popular, not popular at all. So uh, we went ahead and would try to educate them, but you know, like they say, they got to make a living. So we're going to look down on the lower right side, and we're going to look at the uh, DNA. This is not uncommon. Uh, on another case that I'm not presenting today, I had 34 red spots on, on everything. But then, anybody want to take a guess what's going to be the highest common denominator on this? It's a Mavi uh, species again. And so we go ahead and we look at the further toxicity and we look at their levels. The Klebsiella uh, pneumonia is normal in the oral GI skin flora, can cause destructive changes to the lungs if aspirated. So when uh, I talk to Stuart and we're talking about trying to do our best job on keeping things clean during the surgery, you don't want this being aspirated into your lungs. It's just not good for the patient. So you have to get training and understand that what we don't see can hurt you. The histological report shows that superative pulpal necrosis in the apical canal, meaning that it's producing pus. I am partially non-viable bone consistent with ischemic damage, chronic ischemic bone disease. One of the problems that I've had expressed to me by so many doctors doing this is I always get the same report back. I'm sorry, it's the same condition. You can't go out and make up a new condition just so you can have a different name to show. But this is what we're finding here. And it's doing a low level inflammation throughout the whole body. So in summary, microbes at high levels 
Again, the same ones that we saw. We have a positive high grade threes and fours. Oh, these are all fours. And then the bone density is very, very poor. And we have residual necrotic pulp, uh, root canals, and chronic ischemic osteonecrosis. So follow up on uh, this patient. Um, you know, the uh, divorce is over. They're on good talking terms, and uh, the girls are uh, enjoying their parents again. While working with a naturopathic physician, her symptoms diminished to very bearable levels. And we did go ahead and I uh, did place two sarconium implants on the lower left side. We're going to have to bone graft the right side a little, and she's doing very well. She's eating, though she gets tired by the end of the day, and then last week uh, after I wrote this, she's not tired anymore. She has all her energy and vitality back, and none of the condition of the ischemic osteo, uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia are gone, and she just gets tired like most parents do trying to raise teenage girls. So all headaches are gone. TMJ is much better because we reestablished a bite. Um, best of all, she wakes up looking forward to a day where she just didn't want to get up. And then she's not anxious going in for dental work anymore or any of the other problems that we've had. So the clinical case study number two. Is, pardon me? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Ask a question. question here is you do a lot of these cases and it's a systematic approach. What do you do uh, to prepare the patient to try to kill some of these things? Uh, if I treated p patients before or prior to surgery. Uh, we generally don't have that much time with most people to treat them for that. She did come from a natural path. She was doing vitamin C IVs with uh, ozone. So that helped us out. On some patients, if we have time, I will do uh, injections in the mouth and then do ozone treatments. And we will get them started on uh, Sangreo Drago, which is a uh, dragon blood, which is a homeopathic thing. Uh, I also use stuff like um, something you haven't heard about, halo light, which is an uh, ultraviolet light with homeopathic remedies that helps tremendously in healing. It also treats Lyme disease and esteem bar. And um, then we, of course, being in the world of dentistry, we have to produce things like uh, prescriptions for antibiotics. Many of my patients won't take them, but I do work with a lot of MDHs and uh, naturopaths, and we get them in for IVs if they're not going to take um, the antibiotic. But I have an integrative approach. I want them to take everything to kill this out. One more question, and we'll continue. Uh, the dragon blood is actually an antibiotic. <clears throat> yeah, it's used as an antibiotic, and it's very, very cheap. The second case is a 44-year-old female with eight children, all naturally born, and she reports that after every child was born, she was up the next day running around doing whatever moms have to do. This experience with my mouth, root canal therapy with 13, has been the most excruciating pain I've ever experienced. I go to my regular dentist and they say something about an overfill could be a problem. I go to the specialist who tells me it is no big deal. I've had MRIs. I have in Spain pain specialists. Now the pain is so great, I'm in bed most of the time because I can't move or function. I'm very sick. She suffers from dizziness, fatigue, tired all the time. Neurological pain, pain of her ears, TM joint, bilaterally, sinus problems, right side of her neck and head and asthma. Patient extremely nervous, anxious, and scared. Recently in her dental history, she had a root canal therapy on 13 and her pain began. 15 already had a root canal with no symptoms. Her general dentist placed a three in a bridge on a tooth that was hurting, hoping the pain would disappear, but it got worse. The endodontist blamed the pain on the recently placed bridge, regardless of the fact that she had pain prior to placing the bridge, and the general dentist could not explain why the pain was not relieved once she placed the bridge and gave her back her money. The endodontist did not see anything wrong with his treatment. 
So we go ahead. This is what she looked like. She had some missing teeth, 314, root canal teeth, three, uh, 13, 15, 19, restoration based, 2 and 18, mercury fillings, composites on 30 and 31, full porcelain crowns on all the uh, root canal teeth. Her perio was excellent, and here's her uh, x-ray. If you take a look around 13, all those little white spots is gotta percha or whatever filling material they placed in there. And her pain was severe. I mean, this poor woman, I, I couldn't believe it. She had eight kids naturally and went back to life. Never had a problem. But if you take a look, you'll see that um, in the areas where she had missing teeth, she had lack of bone density. Well, let's do this a little more logically so it's easier to see. But what we did was here's the whole upper arch. And this is going to be... Um, one and three, and then this is the left upper side from 12 or 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way back, and then down here 19, 17, and 30. This lady was not doing well. Putting together the results, we looked at the comb beam, and you'll see that we had very, very little when it came to bone density except on 19, which was a root canal tooth, and 15 looked great, and 13 was borderline. And 14 uh, or 4 uh, was, was not that bad. It was a 1545 and 1550 is usually our cutoff. So we start putting these things together. You try to see when comparing the results from both techniques, the edentulous areas have very similar results. So we had scans of 3 and 4 as well. The bone density of 1550 or less also considered for surgical intervention. But because there was a root canal, we also decided with the cavitat to go in there. So there's the uh, first site on the upper right side. And um, just so you know, I'm just presenting this numerically in order. We only did, we did the left side, but we only did the upper left, the first surgery, because she was so sick, we wouldn't go to the lower arch. So we went ahead and we took a look at 13 through 16. And we saw that the grade three, 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 and four, uh, the bone density was low, unbearable pain, headache, sinus, left eye, hurt, dizziness, and nausea. Okay. She couldn't chew on those sites. So we look again at uh, 17 and 19. We, uh, at 17, we had a high grade, a low grade for other sites. And on 19, again, we had only a two, but that was our most recent root canal. Uh, I'm sorry, before 13, it was the most recent canal, but it was tender to palpation. Nothing could hurt as bad as her upper jaw, though. So we went ahead. And uh, we looked at the lower right side. These are fours, one, and zeros there. So just the area 32 was bad. So let's get to the surgery. This is what 13 looked like. I extracted the tooth. Whoops. Not supposed to say whoops as a dentist, right? I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back. And Okay, so we took the tooth out here. And when the tooth came out, this didn't come out. So I did a window and I came out there and when I searched around, I took the bottom of the sinus and in it was gotta percha and their filling material and I took that out of the nasal cavity and of course everybody tells me you can't go in the nasal cavity. Well that's where the infection was. We had to go into there. So we took it out, and instantly her left eye, which was always constricted from pain, released as soon as that abscess tissue was out. And she looked at me and said, what did you do? And so we went ahead, and how many people are using PRF or PRP? Thank you. That is great, because that's how we repaired this by flattening it out, going up there and adding some Steiner socket graft paste, or in that case it could have been sinus graft paste. We added some there and we went through the tooth over the tooth socket here after removing one to two millimeters of the socket carefully. And then uh, we went back, took 15 out, 
Um, and we went into 16. Sometimes when you take that back tooth out here, you don't have to do anything but go right through the back of the socket and clean that. And you keep the cortical plate there. So maintain some of the bone structure if you can. And we were very, very comfortable um, cleaning that out and being pretty darn sure that everything was fine. What did we find after that? We found a whole bunch of bugs. And of course, the winner in the top three is always seems to be the uh, Entub amoeba species there. But we also had some pretty, uh, pretty common stuff. So I try to tell my patients, Rome wasn't built in one day. Steady, slow, and go. Due to her health, we decided to do just the upper left. This turned out to be an excellent decision because she was going to have pain for a number of weeks, and we knew it, and we prepared her for it. And she had a complete turnaround. Three weeks later, she came back to me, and her husband was there. They're a very, very religious uh, family. And she comes up to me and gives me the biggest hug in the world and says, Thank you. Everybody told me I was crazy. And how many times have we heard that? And then she had a complete turnaround. No pain, able to bend her head down, no dizziness. She, she was just so grateful. We went ahead and we did, in another month or so later, uh, we did the lower left side. And um, again, we found pretty much the same results with the DNA. We looked at the toxicity of everything. And I thought, wow, this, this is just something really, really great. So let's discuss some of this stuff. Try to make sense of all the data. I have 30 cases like this. One case has 34 or 35 DNA things. I'm looking for a statistician to help us put all this stuff together to try to figure out what, what we really did find. We divided uh, into either two or four sections or quadrants or a possible total of five or six sessions. In most cases, the arches are divided in upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. In some cases, being treated for an immediate denture or uh, we divide the arches and posteriors right and left and uh, then canine to canine to place the upper denture. Biopsies were collected per quadrant or section. The cost involved in processing each tooth area is way too much, so we have to settle for either segments or quadrants. Uh, in the first table, we, I've named the differential histological diagnosis from histology uh, laboratory reports, the diagnosis associated with the two patients, frequency of quadrants with the histological diagnosis occurrence. So we had in this chronic ischemic osteonecrosis, viable bone and marrow with medullary um, uh, congestion, oil cysts or fatty tissues, failed root canals. Some of them had hemorrhage material, others were pulpal necrosis. Unseen complications, while dentists perform such routine things as root canals and extractions thousands of times a day over the uh, entire world, and nobody asks any questions if there are any complications. What appeared as a simple overfill of a root canal tooth had devastating consequences for this patient. Once 13 root canal tooth was removed and the overfill material excised from her sinus. And I have to tell you something. If we had left that material in her sinus, she would not have gotten better. Okay, along with the removal of 15, another root canal, and cleaning out the third molar area, patient would have had difficult, but um, had a very difficult, but she still had a successful recovery. Unseen complications continued. For uh, at least four weeks, she had pain. She came, and I used a halo light. I also used ozone injections to remove some of the infection pain and help her out. I found through prolotherapy of my knee and shoulders that doing those therapies helped lower my pain, and I find that that also helps lower the pain for my patients as long as I pre -numb them and then add the ozone. There's a nice residual effect. So our treatment phase-wise, which was a good question that Matt just had, uh, we always start with the perio. We remove all metal-based restorations and replace them with non-metal unless we're going to take the tooth out. Why replace the uh, restoration? So we took the mercury fillings out and all the crowns that were needed to be removed were removed because they were attached to a root canal. Surgical 
intervention in removing root canal teeth, abscess teeth, uh, possibly uh, if you have titanium implants, chronic ischemic bone jaw lesions naturally occurring for, uh, from past extraction sites. Removal of all root canal teeth, 13, 15, 19, surgical intervention of areas of past extraction sites. These included all her third molar areas. Third molar areas, even if a patient never had a tooth there, are notorious for ischemic bone because the tooth bud starts and doesn't finish. And that is usually as toxic or more toxic uh, than um, a root canal tooth. When I did my dissertation at Kaplan University, uh, Boyd Haley... <coughs> Pardon me, Boyd Haley had a company called ALT, and that's how we were measuring um, toxicity. And we found that those areas where root canals or where third molars did not grow in were extremely, extremely toxic. But we overlook it because there was nothing there. All areas are open to bridal biopsies sent to the universities and are uh, the only place I dealt with or I will deal with is dental DNA for DNA writing. The patient uh, moved to Virginia and she sends me emails and um, uh, we spoke, uh, this is what she wrote me, we spoke with our lawyer, he needs a letter from you stating your findings in regard to the root canals that were done by Dr. P, and we spoke to Dr. P trying to work something out. Dr. P has changed his story so many times, uh, he never did that, and when I went back to him for help, he dismissed any problems from his work. With that being said, we cannot see that it's going to be a battle of he said, she said, Jeff and I don't feel uh, up to a fight in court, the, the time, energy, and money. I'm not out to damage anyone's reputation or look for extra money, we are not that kind of people. If anything, he he could reimburse us for just the money that we paid him for the root canals, and that would be okay with us. Yes, it would be better if he covered the cost of the correction of his work, but unfortunately, he's in denial, and he won't do that. We are very grateful that we found you and that I am totally on the way to full recovery. To me, that is my answer to our prayer. Jeff works very hard, and all this time and money spent in getting me better has really been a financial strain. This letter that the lawyer will send that must include your findings will be our last and our only attempt to get reimbursed. If not, he'll have to answer to God for not doing the right thing. In the meantime, I found this video on and on and on and she wanted to share it it's something that I, another lecture I gave or something so these poor people uh, just went on with life he of course didn't do anything wrong conclusions and analysis Cone beam computerized topography and ultrasound had 100% correlation in their findings in the dentulous areas. There's no correlation when it comes to the uh, ultrasound and the uh, 3D when it comes to existing teeth. That's due to the fact that uh, you know, you're going to be measuring the density of what's present. When trying to isolate an area for obtaining oral tissue or bi biopsies, one must be careful as possible not to contaminate the sample. That's very difficult because there's saliva in the mouth. And so many people who want to try to destroy your, your techniques and stuff can have a valid point that saliva could contaminate any sample from the mouth. Once a statistician is given all the information I collected on 30 different surgical sites of about 22 different patients, we hope to find comparison histological samples and organisms present. So we compared everything. Four out of six areas, chronic ischemic bone was found, medulla area congestion, one of six, pulpal necrosis of failed root canals, four of six, fibrogen sludge, one of six, viable bone, two of six, oil, fat, necrosis, one of six. I think that the oil, fat, necrosis is much more prevalent, but it's very hard to isolate and put it in there. Uh, it just is so hard to get a good biopsy. We found out that in the uh, 
uh, patient, the number of times histological diagnosis appears in the biopsied area. So um, in the quadrants, patient number four had four quadrants to deal with. The other one only had two. The chronic ischemic bone disease was present in three out of four. Failed root canal. All the root canals were failures, failures, and the viable bone marrow congestion was found uh, around a root canal tooth. So I went through and I did my X's and O's and everything with the uh, DNA testing. You can go through that because I don't want to really try to pronounce these words. They're very, very difficult. But we do have the top five winners. And tibia species was most prevalent and had an average of 15.55 toxicity level, which was the highest. The lowest was the Provotella nicaroscans, and it was only a 12.4. So when we get a report back from Dental Connections, you will see all this stuff and it will tell you how it affects the body and what it does. I already read this to you before. So the whole point is considerations and conclusions by utilizing two different types of laboratories. We report compare similar histological conditions to what organisms were present between different patients with similar or same conditions. Integrative, uh, integrating the information from different sources, we may find missing links in patients suffering from degenerative and other diseased states or situations. There's a diversity of conditions patients are suffering from, chronic system, uh, systematic diseases and oral facial component of patients' health is usually ignored by physicians. Right now, uh, I'm working with the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. I don't know if any of you seen one of these things. And uh, they sent it to me, or let me borrow it for the lecture. If you're not using this for oral cancer detection, we are now starting to do this at the end of our surgery. We put the glasses on, put the light in, and see if we find any black in the area. This year, we have found four black spots. Three turned out to be stage one squamous cell carcinomas that you would never see with your naked eye. Three out of four were found in stage one. That's impossible with the naked eye. I don't get a kickback or anything for this. But if you're not using something like that, I think it's malpractice personally because we're introducing it into the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and we're making the patients, future doctors, aware to look in the mouth. Not only does this show cancer, it shows metal fillings. And they'll be taught that metal fillings are bad. Go see your biological dentist. So, uh, diversity of conditions that people are suffering from, chronic disease while practitioners order multitude of tests at tens of thousands of dollars. They are ignoring the possible root cause of patients' health problems, chronic oral facial disease, which may be non-painful. Patients are tired of being sick. Their health care providers, many laboratory tests costing thousands of dollars, come up with conclusions. You're just fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Patients are turning to the Internet and trying to find solutions not offered by their health care providers. The patients are tired. They're seeking answers. Many of them are finding integrative, biological, holistic dentistry as possible solutions to the mystery of their illness. Sadly, few healthcare practitioners refer to an integrative, holistic, or biological dentist. So after months of unsuccessful treatments, taking multiple different pharmaceutical drugs, supplements, hormonal therapies, detox protocols, and more and more patients becoming discouraged, spending thousands of dollars on laboratory tests, spending time, exams, care, not feeling any better, patients get on that internet. And so my patients tell me that they are tired, almost everything, tried everything else, and it's the worst thing to hear, and I know other people in this audience have heard it, you're my last grasp. 
The other solution may be found in integrative biological holistic dental care. As an integrative dentist, I stress the use of non-toxic restorative materials for dental work. Focus on the impact that dental toxins and hidden dental infections can have on the patient's overall health. This research project was designed to bring together both traditional alternative medicine diagnostic information and offering integrative dentistry to recognize possible causes of degenerative human disease diagnosis and treatments in our patients. So be part of the solution, don't be part of the problem. Thank you and I want to thank Jerry Boko for sprucing up the uh, lecture. And I did get done on time even though we started 10 minutes late. And I know we're going to have a question and answer period. Um, I, can I take two questions? Or is, Mike? Uh, did you take those microbiological samples before the surgery and after, or, or did you already open the wound? Okay, to get the, uh, the question is, how, you know, how did you get the microbiological samples? We have to open up the site to get to them. And if you did a punch where you go through the tissue and go in there and you're doing bone biopsies, you're, you're going to get nothing or something. You don't know. So by opening it up, you have direct access to see what is available and what can be done. Some of them are, uh, the question is it anaerobic? Some are anaerobic. Most of them are anaerobic, yes, but some aren't. And some are viral. One more question? I mean? Well, when you get into these sites, a lot of times there's nothing there. How do you get your biopsy? Um, <clears throat> this was a problem that happened when I was trying to do two biopsies for a study like this or my dissertation at Capital University. And what I would do is I'd take the bone next to it. And what we found out was uh, in the toxicity report, the little that we got, it was very toxic. The other part of the report was it was very normal, healthy bone. So it just shows that the body is trying to wall this stuff off and protect itself. So uh, you can only take a sample next to it and you write on there, nothing there. Many times you open this up, you look at it and say, it's hollow. It's just hollow bone. So again, I want to thank you for choosing coming to talk, uh, listen to me talk today, and uh, I'm very humbled, and thank you.